This collection is also available on 8-track cartridges and cassettes for only $14.98. Yes, here's a unique opportunity to own a complete library of the world's most beautiful music. Here's how to order yours. To order, call toll-free 1-800-257-1257. In Hawaii, call 536-6677. To avoid COD charges, send check or money order. Eleven ninety eight for records, fourteen ninety eight for eight tracks or cassettes. To classics, post office box 8250, Atlanta, Georgia, 30306. under par was enough to win the Kemper Open, and that's just what John Mahaffey did. Among the baseball, the Pirates breeze at home to increase their lead, and in soccer, it went to the absolute limit as the Cosmos won in Washington. Good evening. I'm Nick Charles with Bob Kurtz. This is Sports to the Moment. And Bob, before we hit action in the majors, uh, you've got a big story that happened off the field last night. Oh, I don't know, Nick. He uh, he is known as the straw that stirs the drink. He's the hot dog. They say he's so large a hot dog that all the must in the world cannot <laughs> cover him. He, of course, Reggie Jackson. And wherever he goes, controversy and drama seem to follow him. Last night, for instance, Jackson was up in the 11th inning, Yankee Stadium, game tied, 6-6, Toronto and New York. Boom, he hits it out, and the Yankees win it 8-6. Then, just two hours later, here you see Jackson. This is the game. Reggie up to the plate against the Blue Jays. He wins it in extra innings, 8-6, and the man can come through under pressure. Then, just two hours later, Jackson was involved in a different kind of a very dramatic confrontation. He was driving his car down East 83rd Street when it was blocked by a vehicle that was trying to park. Now, Jackson asked the man to move his car. The man did, but then became upset and threw a bottle from a trash can at Jackson's car. Well, Reggie, then joined by two bystanders, chased the man down the street until the man suddenly turned. He had a gun. He fired three shots. Well, Reggie wasn't hurt. The man was since arrested and identified as Angel Vieira. Jackson said he will press charges. And so today, when the Yankees faced Toronto, Jackson's name was scratched from the lineup by manager Dick Hauser. Ron Guidry had the best line. We learned that Jackson wasn't hurt, however. He said, I'm not going to sit next to Jackson in a dugout anymore. Well, the Yankees did have plenty of power today, though. Without Jackson, New York powered past the Toronto Blue Jays 11-7 to sweep that three-game set. Bobby Brown, Craig Nettles homered. Eric Soderholm had a great day for the Yankees. He went 5-for-5. Five five. That helped Tom Underwood to his fourth straight win. Let's take a look at the American League scoreboard and see exactly what did happen. There you see that Yankee win. Milwaukee trailed 5 nothing in the game against Boston, but battled back to down uh, the Red Sox with Ben Ogilvy having a bases-loaded double to climax a seven-run eighth inning. California and the Tigers and the Twins and the Orioles. There you can see that. They're having all kinds of problems. Uh, rain has postponed or delayed those games. Also in the American League, we have Chicago knocking off Kansas City. Britt Burns won his seventh game. He was a winning pitcher there. Seattle, Cleveland, well, they battled rain all day long, but now they've got it going there in the eighth inning. Seattle is leading Cleveland. Oakland and Texas, the other game that is later tonight. And speaking about Oakland, the A's, of course, the surprise of the American League. They're just a game and a half right now behind Kansas City. And the one man who is responsible for this ragtag team of unknowns ranking above those player millionaires from Texas and California has to be Billy Martin. Now, Billy Martin is successful wherever he goes to manage because he does one thing better than just about anybody else. And he explained to Cable News Sports in Arlington, Texas. Players from spring training on learned a lot of things. We do a lot of things other ball clubs don't do. We do things in spring training other clubs don't do. Uh, we just work to the point where we got to the point where we can force the opposition to make mental and physical mistakes, and uh, we execute well out there in the bases, and we just do a lot of things. How do you like returning here to Arlington Stadium? I like it here in Texas. My home's down here. I live in Arlington, and I like it down here very much. Do you ever have any second thoughts or regrets or remorse about uh, your leaving here? Well, I didn't want to leave here in the first place. It wasn't my choice. If uh, Brad Corbett would have took back what he said, I'd still be here. He said I was fired. Uh -huh. <laughs> the National League today, the Pirates crushed the Mets in Pittsburgh, and a couple of the names on the Pittsburgh club might make you feel we've gone back 20 years. So let's go to Three Rivers Stadium, Pittsburgh, and pick it up. The bottom of the third inning, and Dale Berra, who's now playing for the Pirates, uh, everybody rem remembers his father, and uh, Yogi Berra. This double sliced the left field. Almost out. Left fielder can't handle it. So Barra on second. Then 
Vance Law, son of Vernon Law, first at bat in the major leagues, grounds to short, but Frank Tavares kicks it. He had three errors, Tavares, in the game. The Mets, uh, or the Pirates go ahead. Mets later tie it. But bottom of the fourth, Steve Nicosia, this single to left, scores Bill Madlock, uh, who had doubled, and the Pirates took the lead, and Barra just nails it shot here, uh, triggering a seven-run fifth inning with this explosion, a grand slam homer. Jim Bibby spaced eight hits, won his sixth game against one loss. So now we go to Dodger Stadium. Uh, on the West Coast, Chris Chambliss, this single. Scores Hubbard. Now Hubbard, the Glenn Hubbard just recalled from the minors from Richmond. Hubbard is in playing second base for Jerry Royster. Bob Horner celebrated today. Goodbye. Got every bit of this Dave Gold's pitch. Drove it out. The Braves in a cakewalk. It looked like 4 nothing at this point. Now, Doyle Alexander in the mound for the, for the Braves and Steve Garvey, one of the best swings in the, to the toughest part of the park here. It's over and out. Murphy has no shot, and the Dodgers close it, but Horner locks it shut here. Another home run off Charlie Huff this time. Slow knuckle this over center field. The Braves go on to win it 9-5. to five. So they start to roll again, and they salvage that last game on the West Coast. Did pretty well, in fact. So Pittsburgh, an easy winner. We checked the scoreboard. They widen their lead in the East because at Wrigley Field this afternoon, the Cubs beat the Phillies 5-4. Scott Thompson's RBI single of the seventh wanted. Phil's Mike Schmidt smacked his 17th homer, but they dropped two behind first place Pittsburgh. At St. Louis, Warren Cromartie's 12th inning single puts Montreal over the Cardinals. Stan Bonson, razor sharp and relief, won it. Now the West Coast, Atlanta uh, beating uh, L.A., as we said, 9-5 at Candlestick. The Giants iced it with three in the eighth, and they beat Houston 6-2. Cincinnati behind a Johnny Bench three-run homer. They lead the Padres 7-5, playing the uh, eighth inning on the West Coast. Bob? Fans, Law, and Dale Barra, huh? Don't we feel old? Coming up, we'll have a thrilling shootout in soccer between Washington and the New York Co or, and, and the Cosmos. Golf, there's lots of heat at Congressional, but didn't stop John Mahaffey. And we'll take a look at just who makes the most money in sports. Stay with us. Are you sure you shouldn't be seeing your doctor? Right now. You see, the human body has a built-in alarm system that gives off warning signals when something goes wrong. And not knowing what your body's trying to tell you can really be dangerous. But here's good news. Dr. Isidore Rosenfeld has just written the complete medical exam. It's easy to understand, takes the mystery out of medicine. Dr. Rosenfeld is a world-famous cardiologist, a heart doctor a clinical professor of medicine at New York Hospital, and an expert on sudden death. And his is the first book ever to tell you what your symptoms mean and if you should see a doctor immediately and why. You'll also find out about your blood pressure, what your cholesterol level really means, the hazards of dieting, the right way a woman should examine her breasts, and what you can do to prevent a heart attack. You'll find out about your prostate, gallbladder, back aches, headaches, and what they mean, and what you can do about them. The latest on arthritis, and what it means if you're always tired. Do you have a sleeping problem? Well, on page 94, you learn how to deal with it. You'll even learn the secret of how to discuss costs with your doctor. Now, thousands have paid $11.95 for the complete medical exam book, but for a limited time only, it's yours for just $9.95. And it comes to you on a 30-day money-back guarantee. You know, this book could save the life of a loved one. Here's how to order. To order your medical aid encyclopedia, phone toll-free 1-800-257-1257. In Hawaii, call 536-6677. Or to avoid COD charges, send a check or money order for $9.95 to Medical Book, Post Office Box 8250, Atlanta, Georgia, 30306. In the news headlines to this minute, President Carter visits with civil rights leader Vernon Jordan. Iran places its armed forces on alert along the Iraqi border. Reports that Saudi Arabia will raise its oil prices $4 a barrel. Israeli Prime Minister Begin assumes the defense portfolio himself. And coming up in our next hour, an update on Mount St. Helens. Right now, back to sports. Okay, we have a final just in, 7-6, uh, Cincinnati over San Diego in baseball, a final. And in golf, he's called the baby-faced assassin. We're talking about John Mahaffey. He's the shortest hitter, or one of the shortest hitters on the tour. He also is one of the most accurate. And today, they were playing at Congre Congressional in Washington. 
And there you see it. What a marvelous course this is. Tight and demanding. And Mahaffey fought off the Super Mechs, Lee Trevino, Tom Watson, and the rest to take that $72,000 first prize. This is the birdie on 18 that wins it. Previously, he had just birdied 17. That gave him a 275 total, and he picks up that 72 grand. Craig Stadler, watch him leave it on the lip. For the men, tremendous preparation, being able to play congressional with a tight course, the small greens. They are able to prepare for the United States Open, which comes up in two weeks, and they will be ready now after playing congressional, which incidentally was the site of Ken Venturi's great triumph in 1964. In women's golf, it was young Beth Daniel who was the winner, in fact, winning her second tour event. She shot a 171. She wins by two over Nancy Lopez and Joanne Washam. Nancy's Navy was happy as Nancy shook off her slump of recent weeks to shoot a 66 yesterday and battle down the wire today. But it was Beth Daniel again who won the $125,000 tournament. Bob, soccer today, a tremendous high-energy game at RFK Stadium. The diplomats and Cosmos went to the limit. RFK Stadium, Washington, D.C., biggest crowd there in the history of the game, over 53,000, and the diplomats didn't disappoint by carrying the first half after a flagrant foul. Washington's Bobby Rushi gunned this penalty shot past keeper Hubert Birkenmeyer, and that lone goal stood to halftime, but the Cosmos got it together. DiBernardo throws, throws it in from the corner. Carlos Alberto, now watch this instant control, the perfect pack, pass in the box, and number nine in the dark, Giorgio Canaglia, that instinctual will to win the ball in the air and a goal. 1-1. One, one. Washington thought they had it won with four minutes left. The uh, goal was disallowed. Now the shootout after two scoreless overtimes. Nobody through eight shots could score. But finally, Bogisevich pumped it by Bill Irwin on the ninth shot of the, over uh, the shootout. Washington gets their last shot. 90 minutes come down to this. But Cosmos goalkeeper Birkenmeyer wraps Sarucci up and it's over. Final Cosmos 2, Diplomats 1. So with the win, the Cosmos strengthen an already unyielding grip on first in the American East. Tonight, a big game for Toronto at home against powerful Dallas. On the West Coast this afternoon, San Jose is trailing California 3-2 with 14 minutes to play. San Diego shut out at Edmonton 1-0. And earlier at the Vet in Philadelphia, the Fury found their offense and beat New England 5-2. Bob? Well, Nick, in tennis, the quarterfinals are now set in the French Open. That's a $650,000 tournament. Jimmy Connors won today when his opponent, the youngster Yannick Noah, tripped and hurt his leg. Noah tried to continue. Connors, in fact, said the young Frenchman looked like a young Holt, uh, Colt uh, hobbling around out there. Didn't help. Connors went on to win. They finally had to stop it. It was 7-5, 6-4 when the French star finally did quit. Noah had reached the finals of the Italian Open last week, and his countrymen had hoped that he would become the first native Frenchman to win the French Open in some 34 years. Also advancing to the quarterfinals today were Vias, who was the number one seed, and he crushed Buster Nottrum of uh, Great Britain. Harold Solomon also won, as did Brian Godfrey. Now, Brian Godfrey has played in every French Open for the past 10 years. Chris Everett Lloyd led the women into the quarterfinals. There you see the men with Vias, Solomon, and Godfrey all winning. Okay, with the women, it was Chris Everett Lloyd who led the ladies into the quarterfinals. A hard-fought win over Bettina Mungi. She'll face Kathy Jordan. It took less than an hour to advance. Now, the other quarterfinal pairing in the top of the draw will have Ivana Madruga, who goes up against Virginia Wade. She upset Virginia Wade. She'll go against Hanna Manlikova of Czechoslovakia. Tomorrow morning, the Maryland Racing Commission holds a hearing to consider the Preakness question. Namely, did the winner, Kodaks, bump the runner-up, Philly Genuine Risk, enough to eliminate her chance of winning? This corner says no question it was interference. Whether it cost genuine risk the win does not matter. Angel Cordero, Road Codex, Jacinto Vasquez was aboard genuine risk. Now, Vasquez immediately lodged an objection that the Maryland stewards didn't beat him to the punch and flash the inquiry sign to me as inexcusable. In fact, it's outrageous. The bump happened at the key point in the race when they were straightened for home and when both the Colt and Philly were switching leads. This is where a horse fires when you ask for that final winning burst. Genuine risk had her momentum destroyed. There's no question. If she was the chalk favorite going into the Preakness, she is at best, though, a long shot in this hearing. We'll see tomorrow afternoon if justice will overrule tradition. In the meantime, it sets up a tantalizing, absolutely tantalizing race on the Belmont Saturday, doesn't it? Question of justice over tradition? I say so. <laughs> okay. Uh, two big auto races today. Alan Jones of Australia won the Spanish Grand Prix. In fact, only five cars were able to finish. The temperature was up near 100 degrees. Jones is now tops in the world standing. The NASCAR 400 was in College Station, Texan. Cale Yarbrough was the man at the pole. Well, he held on all the way and won it, despite the fact that he ran out of gas. So he was able to limp in and still come up winning. Nick?
Well, how fast can a person run or how high can they jump? Well, for the second time in two weeks, somebody shattered the world pole vault record. Today in a meet just outside Paris, young Frenchman Terry Vigneron cleared 18 feet, 10 and 3 eighths inches. He's good, but this is no surprise. Vigneron set the world junior mark just last year. Uh, today he broke the mark set May 11th by Poland's Ladislav Kazakowicz, doing it despite a driving wind and steady rain. Bob? Well, we are told that most of us work into May paying off our income taxes, our state and our local taxes and Social Security before we finally start working for ourselves. Well, how do athletes do it? At the end of May, they do considerably better than the rest of us do. This is in the uh, professional golf ranks. Watson and Young are the leaders there. However, they have not done nearly as well as the tennis leaders. Borg and Martina Navratilova. Navratilova, interestingly enough, has won more money than any of the men tennis players. But those figures pale in comparison with jockey Chris McCarron, who pockets 10% of the $2 million worth of uh, winnings that his horses have won. And Spectacular Bid, well, Spectacular Bid only gets good grooming and a little bit extra grain for winning some uh, half a million dollars. Makes us all feel great, <laughs> doesn't it? Keep working, Bob. NASL update, California beats San Jose a final 3-2. When we come back, the commissioner of the National Football League, Pete Rosell, will join us live in our studio. So stay with us. Oil shortages, energy crisis, inflation, high cost of living, unemployment. If today's headlines scare you as much as they do me, maybe it's time you started giving serious consideration to our future. I'm Warren Johnson, author of Muddling Toward Frugality, a guide for survival in the years ahead. Some people don't believe that there is an energy crunch, but most of us already realize that it does exist and is affecting us all. The question is, what can we do to continue to live as comfortably as possible in times of scarcity? My book attempts to answer this question by taking a revealing look at our past and exploring many of the reasons for our present crisis. But more importantly, it takes a look at the options for our future and outlines a guide for simple yet comfortable living. Almost all of our economic problems stem from the high cost and scarcity of our non-renewable energy resources. The cheap energy we use to run our industries, transport our food, and mass produce the many products we use every day. Sooner or later, we must face the fact that our incomes will not be able to keep up with the rising cost of energy. And our energy sources will no longer be able to support industry the same way they do today. But our future does not have to be bleak. In Muddling Toward Frugality, I point out that we are being given a great chance to move back to a simpler, more rewarding way of life. For example, as rising energy costs and shortages make large businesses that rely on cheap energy more and more unfeasible, new opportunities for small-scale economic activities will develop. And it will be those people who can take advantage of these opportunities and build a safe, comfortable, and frugal way of life with close ties to family and friends that will be doing the right thing. I urge you all to start planning now for the future by reading Muddling Toward Frugality, a guide for living as comfortably as possible in the changing times ahead. To receive your copy of Muddling Toward Frugality, send $2.95 plus $1 shipping and handling to Muddling, P.O. Box 8250, Atlanta, Georgia, 30306. Or use your Master Charge or Visa cards by calling 1-800-257-1257. Here's the news making headlines at this moment. The Democratic race in the California primary is said to be too close to call. President Carter warns Iran today that no form of U.S. retaliation has been ruled out if the hostages are put on trial. Doctors at a Fort Wayne hospital say they expect civil rights leader Vernon Jordan to recover fully. And coming up in the next hour, a report on that riot in Zurich. Now back to sports. Our guest uh, joining us for our inaugural day, uh, a name that's known to everyone in sports, Pete Rozelle, the commissioner of the National Football League. Interestingly enough, it is now 20 years since you've been appointed commissioner, and in 20 years, we, 20 years ago, there was no Super Bowl. There was uh, no AFC conference. There was just the AFL getting started, and Pittsburgh was the weakest team in the National Football League. <laughs> what else have you seen in 20 years? Oh, I think probably the big thing would be through uh, expansion and merger going from the 12 teams that were there when I took the job in 1960 to 28 now through expansion and merger. And then, uh, you know, being on all three television networks, of course, is, is quite a change. But uh, mainly it's just the size of it now is against what it was then. 
Pete, can I ask you, uh, Jack Tatum's book, have you read it? I've read excerpts from it. I haven't read the entire book. Uh, what do you think, just basically? I, a lot of people are concluding that to some degree the NFL encourages this type of thing. I talk to players, nobody seems to mind. I don't know if they're protecting Jack or what. I think the problem is that there's a fine line in a, uh, in a physical contact sport, but it, it has to be a disciplined form of physical contact within the rules. Mm -hmm. And you've got coaches who want to win, and they want their players to be aggressive. And I think sometimes that, that line is crossed, and when it's crossed, we have to take action. But insofar as uh, the philosophy expressed in Jack's book, uh, I, I totally disagree with it, and I'm sure that everyone in the NFL does. Mm -hmm. I talked to Ed Garvey the other day, and he says they are in favor. The, Ed Garvey, of course, the executive director of the Players Association, they're in favor of instant replay. They support it. They say the ref should have a view. This is Ed now quoting mm -hmm. him, a view equal to that, at least of a fan at home. And he says they could accomplish it by using what the networks have. You stick the extra referee in the booth, and he makes a decision. Each team's allowed two timeouts for instant replay. I, wish it, would be, I wish it would be that clear. But for anyone who saw the Preakness the other day, <laughs> uh, I give you that as an That's example. Right. I think people saw that shot, and some said, well, genuine risk should have been declared the winner. And others would have said, well, it wasn't sufficient. Mm -hmm. uh, you would need so many cameras. I think perhaps someday that we'll have it. But you would have to uh, have it so it'd be absolutely conclusive. The clubs don't like it right now because they think it would be unfair where a shot is clear, it shows the play, and the official is overruled. Then the other team is involved in a mm -hmm. similar play, say, a few, uh, a few minutes later. And rather than covering the wide receiver, they got an isolated on the linebacker. They show the running back. The play isn't seen, so they don't overrule the official. So they feel that inconsistent inconsistency of change would be uh, would be unfair to them. Mm -hmm. Oakland was involved in a number of uh, controversial plays. Why does it seem like uh, most of your headaches come from Oakland? Ah. Tatum, uh, the, the that, Al and of course Al Davis now, uh, you know, screaming that he is being held hostage in Oakland. Uh, how do you answer that when they say when he says that uh, you know the Rams get to move everybody gets to move and Al Davis doesn't get to move? Well, the Ram move was of course to the suburbs of Los Angeles, about 35 miles. Uh, you had Detroit moving to Pontiac, you had uh, the Buffalo team moving to Orchard Park, the Dallas Cowboys to Irving, Texas, the Giants, uh, the Giants yeah. across the river to Jersey, and. Uh, However, in the case of the Oakland wanting to move to Los Angeles, it calls for a league vote. And the Raiders declared that they were going to move uh, without a vote. And that's what's prompted this litigation. And of course, it's a matter of great concern for me in my job, because if we're going to have owners come into the league, accept the Constitution, but then say, I'm going to be somewhat selective in my observance of the rules. If I'm outvoted uh, 21 to to, uh, to seven, most of our votes call for three-quarters of approval. If I don't get enough votes in this area, I'm going to do what I want. Mm -hmm. you if you have that, you have anarchy, and that's you what you're the winner here. I, I understand that. I think uh, we're all assuming Oakland's going to stay in Oakland, the Raiders, this year. And then, do you have any clue what's going to happen? Well, would you project? It, you, it's hard to predict the courts, but at this point, it would seem unlikely they'd be able to get enough sufficient clearance from the courts mm -hmm. to move this year. Mm -hmm. So right now, the likelihood is they'll play in Oakland. And then the rest will depend upon what the courts tell us. Is there something behind all this? I mean, is Al Davis a maverick because of the old AFL days? Is there something a little bit behind that? In this case, I think he just wants to move to Los Angeles because financially he feels with what the offer made by the Los Angeles, the city of Los Angeles, it'll be much more attractive for him. Pete, how do you feel about um, shared revenue? And some people, and Ed Garvey is one, uh, once again, I, I hate to bring out the <laughs> devil's ad advocate, but he is the other side says that it kills incentive with a 60-40 split at the gate, $5 million to every club, regardless of one loss record, they're going to make that $5 million, which is two-thirds of their income. There's no incentive to really build a winner. Well, I think you have to be around a football team to understand there's plenty of incentive. And I know that the disciplinary action I have to take, including dra taking draft choices away from teams because they, they try and violate the player limit by sneaking players in, maybe working them out during the season and other things like that. You can tell it's, it's highly competitive. Mm -hmm. They want to get to that Super Bowl. And uh, anyone close enough to a football team will, will tell you that. Uh, we do share revenue. I don't feel we're, we're economic competitors to any great extent. We share the television equally. Well, by, sh by, selling the, by sharing the television equally, then you have a San Diego, a Green Bay, 
getting as much money from television as New York, Chicago, Los Angeles, or Philadelphia. So they have the means to compete. They have the means to hire good scouts. They have the means to hire good coaches. And then when we have competitive balance, where we have uh, uncertainty, where over 40% of our games are decided by seven points or less, we have close divisional races, that attracts television. And that's one of the reasons we're getting the money that we have. Does it scare you, though? Is the NFL overexposed? They're starting to be overexposed? We're very careful about that. I don't think we are now. To give you an example of how concerned we are, we've put our money where our mouth is the last three years. Our deal with ABC for Monday Night Football is that we'll have between four and six specials, either on a Sunday or a Thursday night, in addition to the Monday night games. Mm -hmm. And whether it's four, five, or six is up to us. It's $3 million a game. We've held it at four in 78, 79, and this year. And now that means we left $18 million on the table just because we were concerned about overexposure. Are you surprised very briefly about the lack of free agent movement from club to club? Not particularly because when the formula was set, it was set at a certain level. And mm -hmm. I think Ed Garvey achieved one of the things that he wanted, to give the players, the average player, the leverage to make more money. Now the problem there was that when he got the leverage to make more money, it put him into a higher compensation category. We have lots of questions we'd like we to million. ask you, and we're, we we're a running a little bit out of time. We'd like to thank you very much for being with us. And you see the future. Now, you're meeting here in Atlanta for a week, and uh, the NFL meeting and so forth. You see the future is bright? I see it as very bright at this point. We can't live without the NFL, can oh, we? Oh, we sure can't. It's replaced a lot of things. It's a pastime for a while. When we return, uh, thank you, Pete Rozell, Fred Hickman, and Dan Carney review that what was probably an unequal month in sports. So stay with us. I feel like I couldn't be any more comfortable than I am right now. We're eavesdropping with hidden cameras as a big car owner test drives the new Dodge Diplomat. It's got a great ride. You know, it's not noisy. We're talking good gas mileage. You're definitely talking about a winner. So if you're moving down for better mileage, but want to keep that big car feeling, see the new Dodge Diplomat. It's got all the comfort I need, and I'm a big guy. Come to the Dodge Celebration Sale. Get a $300 rebate on specially tagged diplomats. Did you know that there are at least 23 million American adults who can't read a want ad? Or a book, or a job application. That's why we have RIF. RIF is Reading is Fundamental. It's a national nonprofit program that makes kids really want to read. Give a kid a book and you'll give a kid a break. Join the RIF program in your community. Or write RIF, Box 23444, Washington, D.C. Hey, you're pretty smart. How'd you get so smart? Reading. Thanks to you, it works for all of us, the United Way. I'm Leslie Nielsen, and I wish I could really thank you for the help you've given people through United Way. I wish I could thank you for the family whose child the doctor said will be able to walk, for the single mother who can take her little girl to a day care center so that she can work, for the old woman who sees a friendly face and has a hot meal, for the kids who have been abused or abandoned, but all of these people and many more can thank you a lot better than I can, and they'd like to. They're inviting you to visit a United Way agency so that they can thank you personally. headlines to the moment. 80 Iraqi soldiers are killed or wounded in fighting along the Iran border. 1,800 Marines are leaving the Arabian Sea. Mount St. Helens has its first quiet Sunday in three weeks. Investigators say they are puzzled about the shooting of civil rights leader Vernon Jordan. And coming up in the next hour, more on the Amtrak train shooting. Right now, back with sports.
Welcome back to Sports Sunday. I'm Dan Carney along with Fred Hickman. And Nick and Bob, we're telling you, the month of May packed with sports. Fred, as you know, we have the National Basketball Association playoffs and the National Hockey League playoffs. Well, that's just the beginning. We almost saw baseball, Major League Baseball, come to a screeching halt with a strike that was averted in the 11th hour. We see uh, golf's Tom Watson. He's found himself a place among the superstars of the game. Johnny Rutherford took his third Indy 500. Busy, busy month. For instance, in the horse racing world this year, there was no one clear-cut triple crown favorite. Among the three-year-olds, the, there wasn't a spectacular bid, a firm, secretariat, or Seattle slew in the bunch. So this year's Triple Crown was up for grabs. Every horse and the one filly had a legitimate shot at winning the first jewel, the Kentucky Derby. And not many thought that the lady could even stay with the boys. But Genuine Risk did stay with the boys and more. She left them in the dust. Her trainer, Leroy Jolly, didn't think she had a chance. But one time, Genuine Risk challenged the field of Colts was in the Wood Memorial just prior to the Derby. And she lost to Plug Nickel and Colonel Moran two in this derby field, but other than the one loss, she was undefeated. Watch her as she rounds the field. Two favorites, Plug Nickel and Rock Hill Native saw no pacing in this class and went for all the marbles early. Genuine risk, waited till they burned each other out and went on to prove to the nation and her trainer that she was, in fact, genuine. The risk wins the 105th running of the Kentucky Derby. It was the first time the Phillies since regret in 1915, but could genuine risk take the second jewel at Pimlico, the Preakness Stakes? Like in the Derby, she begins to round the field in the far turn with Jacinto Vesquez in the irons. The risk meets number three Codex with Angel Cordero aboard, but right here, watch it, Codex bore out and hit Genuine Risk, a hit that would later result in an inquiry. Never before in the history of this race had a number been taken down and a new official winner announced, and the stewards kept with the tradition. At this point, it's all Codex. He came down the stretch like he came down the stretch in the Santa Anita Derby and the Hollywood Derby, out in front, and Genuine Risk in the middle of the track could never catch him. The same problem Rumbo had in the Hollywood and Santa Anita Derbies. Codex with Angel Cordero aboard withstood the foul claim and the challenge of genuine risk and wins the Preakness Stakes. So this sets up the Belmont Stakes. Horse Racing's third jewel of the Triple Crown. It's coming up this Saturday. We'll have the winner of the Kentucky Derby, Genuine Risk, the winner of the Preakness Codex, and the horse that will challenge both. Rumbo. Rumbo was closing in on Codex in the Hollywood and Santa Anita derbies. He didn't run in the Preakness, but he was closing in fast on Genuine Risk in the Kentucky Derby, so it should be quite a race. I know who you are going with, Fred. I like Rumbo. Okay. I like Rumbo in the Derby, Dan. Another kind of racing now. Over 250,000 shirt-sleeved auto racing fans invaded the Indianapolis Brickyard over the Memorial Day weekend. They came to witness the 64th running of the Indianapolis 500. That was a unique race in that 10 of the drivers out of the 33-car field had absolutely no championship experience before entering. But it was this man, the veteran from Texas, Johnny Rutherford, who drew the pole and went on to win the race. It was his third win at the Indy 500. His winning speed of 142.8 miles per hour was the slowest turned in since 1962. But the purse was the biggest ever. Rutherford banked $318,000, and even Larry Cannon, who finished last place in the race, went away smiling with a $25,000 check. The game of professional golf, as I said at the top, has a new superstar as we begin the 80s. His name is Tom. Tom Watson. He's a sure bet to beat all of the all-time single uh, winnings record with a cool $340,000 in prize money already banked. Watson began the month of May by winning the Byron Nelson Classic. He moved on to the Memorial where he finished second and he was also second to the Colonial Tourney. He finished one over par today out of the big, big money in the Kemper Open just completed. But it looks like Watson will finish the season as the PGA's leading money winner for the fourth consecutive year. He can also be named the Tour's Player of the Year for the fourth straight time. But even if those titles elude him, Watson is no doubt the game's golf golf game's uh, most dominant player since Jack uh, Nicklaus back in the early 70s. I worked very hard at the game. I uh, I, I never gave up on myself. I had uh, a very understanding wife and uh, a very good caddy behind me, and it would it uh, all gelled it seemed in 1977 when I I, uh, I won four tournaments there, and then I've won five tournaments uh, the last three years. Right now, Dan uh, Watson is gearing up for next door for the uh, week after next one. We'll have the U.S. Open coming up. That is the only major title he hasn't won yet, and I think you'll have a good chance at it. All right, Fred. In the month of May, the National Hockey League Stanley Cup playoffs provided new life to the game itself. For the first time in quite a while, we had an All-American final series, the Philadelphia Flyers. The team with the best record in all the NHL this season was the clear-cut favorite over the New York Islanders. But the Islanders were the hottest thing going the last two weeks of the season, and they kept their momentum going uh, into the playoffs. They beat the L.A. Kings, the Boston Bruins, and the Buffalo Sabres to reach the finals. And in Game 1 of the championship series, the Islanders go into the Philadelphia spectrum and beat the Flyers on their own ice. 
There's a surprise. With a score tied at three apiece on the power play, the Islanders with a puck. Marl to Nystrom. The puck makes its way over to John Tonelli behind the goal. He gets it to Dennis Potvan, and it's in for the score. The Islanders win it in extra time, 4-3, to three, and take a psychological advantage as well as a one to nothing game lead. Then, on May 24th, in game six, with a score of 4-3, to three, Islanders, McLeish with a puck, up to Moose Dupont, he shoots, and it's deflected by John Paddock in the net for the tie score, now in overtime. John Tanelli coming up the ice, he feeds over to Bob Nystrom, shoots and scores, and the Islanders win the series in the Stanley Cup, four games to two, and they're going wild in Uniondale, New York. Not since 1940, when the Rangers beat the Toronto Maple Leafs, has this Big Apple owned the Stanley Cup. And for the first time in their eight-year existence, the New York Islanders make it into the finals and win the whole ball of wax. So, the Stanley Cup belongs to the Islanders, but remember, the Flyers had one of the hottest first half seasons ever, establishing a new record, going 35 games, consecutive games, without a loss. And professional basketball fans could ask for no more exciting championship series than the one they got in the month of May. The Philadelphia 76ers and the Los Angeles Lakers finally appeased their frustrated followers by going all the way to the championship series. The six-game classic featured the two most dominant players in the game today, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar for the Los Angeles Lakers and Dr. Julius Irving for the Philadelphia 76ers. Abdul-Jabbar set the tempo for the Lakers early. His patented skyhooks were almost always out of the reach of Philadelphia defenders. And the Dr. J, well, he was his usual awesome self offensively. The Lakers had the momentum going into game five, but L.A. fans were hushed in the third period when Kareem Abdul-Jabbar pulled up lame on that play. He was taken out of the ball game, but the Lakers did not lay down. Irvin Magic Johnson, Michael Cooper both went to work. This play ended the third period. And then one of the most dramatic moments of the season, Abdul-Jabbar returned. His left ankle badly sprained, and the big fellow was obviously playing with a lot of pain. But despite the injury, Abdul-Jabbar played a great defense and came up with this three-point play to win the ball game, 33 seconds left. May 16th now, Friday, the sixth and final game, belonged to the magic man, Irvin Johnson. He had a brilliant rookie campaign for the Lakers, bringing a youthful energy to a veteran club. He culminated the season with a 42-point performance in that final game, bringing Los Angeles their first NBA championship in nine years. It was a champagne uh, cocktail for Paul Westhead and a bitter loss for Billy Cunningham's 76ers. And May was also the month in which the newest team in the NBA became a reality. The Dallas Mavericks, owned by Norm Sanju, will take the court next season as the league's 23rd franchise. And Fred, we were all wondering throughout the month of May whether we'd be having baseball in the summer months. The Major League Players Association and the league owners could not come to terms on a new contract. The deadline for reaching the agreement was midnight, May 22nd, and all America went to sleep that night figuring the strike was assured. But Marvin Miller for the Players Association and Ray Greeby, president of the Players Relations Committee, worked all through the night and reached a new agreement. And there wasn't anyone or anything who wasn't ecstatic that the strike was averted. Every fan and anyone connected with the baseball was happy. The announcement was made that day. From the point of view of the 26 clubs, we think it's a good agreement. It has something in it for everybody. Uh, we look forward to working together, and uh, we look forward to the game growing uh, with us together. Marvin? Mm -hmm. uh, I would endorse uh, what Ray just said. Um, I think that uh, whenever you reach a good agreement, uh, and I hope that uh, it will be portrayed this way, that both parties have achieved a victory. You know, it would have been something not to have the national pastime around for the summer months. It would take some kind of alternative to match the action we've witnessed so far this baseball season. Let's take a look at some of them.
It's going to be a great season. That's Sports Sunday for this week. And we'll be back throughout the evening with more sports for you. Nick and Bob will be along in three hours with a full half-hour roundup, and we will talk to you a little bit later.